Uh, Mike Usdan with the Institute for Educational Leadership. Uh, I'd like to thank CED, uh, Tom Paisant and I. I've been an admirer for more years than either one of us would like to admit. And I uh, thank CED for bringing him in and sharing his wisdom. Uh, building on the human capital theme, Tom, uh, I'd like to ask you uh, in terms of what has been a tremendously successful career in diverse school districts as a traditionally prepared superintendent and now working with Broad, in which one of the major thrusts of the, uh, the Broad approach has been to uh, essentially embellish or enrich the pool of prospective urban school superintendents with people coming from non-traditional backgrounds. And on, on the basis, uh, again, of your rich experience, your new experience, the big cities, we really still have only a handful of non-traditional superintendents, but they are basically situated in our very major, most publicly visible school districts, New York, Chicago, Philadelphia, uh, Detroit, et cetera. Uh, would you comment on this new movement and uh, uh, your, your perspectives on this issue? Well, the, the little secret that we may not have shared about me is that I was really a non-traditional. Um, Right out of college, I went to the Ed School at Harvard and got a Master of Arts in Teaching. And that was a, a summer program, which was really a boot camp because we were working in a, a district that had a summer school four hours a day, and there were four students with a master teacher, and each of us had to teach one hour of that four. And then the afternoons were not a culture of nice, incredibly direct, sometimes brutal feedback on what was working and what was not, and I thought that would be what I would face going forward. Two years in Tacoma, Washington, working in an inner city uh, junior high in those days, then back to Harvard to get my doctorate. And then, because of, and then it was a good old boy connection, now it's good old girls and boys at Harvard, uh, I got to New Orleans where the superintendent in New Orleans Parish Public Schools had gone through that doctoral program at Harvard. I was an administrative assistant for two years. His contract was up. He said, I'm leaving. I'll try to put you in a job where you get a couple of direct reports so you can learn what that's all about. But he said, maybe there'll be some crazy school board out there that will hire you. And in those days, there were professors in colleges and universities that had their list of graduate school, uh, graduate students, and a district would call them up and say, who should we interview? I got to an interview in this small district that was the adjacent to the Chestnut Hill section of the city, and not quite 29, they hired me. Four years there, five and a half years in Eugene, four years in Oklahoma City, almost 11 in San Diego, first Clinton administration, and then Boston. That was non-traditional. So I am much more open. I never was a principal. I didn't do 10 years of teaching in the classroom, although I had never forgotten what the two and a half years were like and what I learned. So I'm much more open. I think it's the capacity that people have to lead and their ability to learn in new, new sectors that which is unique to the sector versus what is routine in terms of across sectors in terms of leadership requirements. Great, and I believe we have a question online. Yes, there's a question from Anthony Huss from Corporate Voices for Working Families. At Corporate Voices, we see many businesses enter the education forum to address a lack of skills in employees as they enter the workforce. Do you see any businesses entering into the Boston school system and helping to establish a new or alternative curriculum that leads to greater workforce readiness among graduating students? Does this lead to a credential? I think the answer to that is some of what is being suggested is apparent in a number of places around the country. One of the most important assets that I inherited in Boston was an external organization called the Boston Plan for Excellence that was originally put together by the business community. And it was of great value to me because it was able to do some of the things from outside the system that I couldn't do inside to move change and improvement strategies. And it had a, a small staff but still support from the business community. And there were people who were skilled on the business side and skilled on the education side who were employees of that Boston Plan for Excellence. 
that's one of the best experiences I've had in terms of something that got started with the business community because they were concerned about what was not happening in Boston Public Schools, but found an organization that could blend business interests with broader interests and make it work. Great. All right. Anyone else? Any other questions here? Janet has a question. Tom, um, I know that you had uh, the experience of having a long, comparatively speaking, time to serve as superintendent in Boston and under a mayor who I believe was there for your entire tenure. Still is. Which, and still is there. <laughs> uh, which is, of course, as most people in this room probably realize, pretty extraordinary in terms of the challenges facing urban school leaders and the constant turnover. In term, I don't quite know how to frame this as a question, but in terms of the kinds of issues you're talking about, in terms of the kind of challenges that you see facing districts, would you sort of talk about yeah. the advantages you had and the issues you think this raises in other places? Um, had I had more time, I would have. that was in my notes. And it's an important question, because I was very fortunate that I had the, the kind of long runs that I had. I had nothing less than four years, and then the two districts, San Diego and Boston. And by the way, Boston was the most complex that I had, so don't ever think that just size aligns automatically with complexity. If you, oh, San Diego, you had 120,000 kids when you were there. I said, no. Boston's three times as complex. I had 65 when I got there. So um, I think it's important. When I started out, I used to move principals around every two or three years. And I quickly learned that that wasn't enough time to really get any kind of improvement work and reform work going in deep roots. So I don't think that what would have happened in San Diego and, and Boston, or even Eugene, which is the only place I almost got fired when I was there five and a half years, without some continuity. And the average is three years for big city superintendents. I don't believe you can get significant change and improvement as a leader in an organization. You can get the beginnings of it. Then the other critical issue is the conversation about sustainability and change. And so many leaders, whether it's at the school level or at the district level, believe that when they get into the leadership role, in order to make their mark, they got to change everything. And the nice thing about my announcement my retirement, which my colleague said was ridiculous a year early because I'd become a lame duck. Just the opposite happened. I got a lot more assignments to get finished in that year. But outside groups came in and looked at Boston. And the conversation about sustainability and change was real. And a lot was written about Boston. And so it's, as a leader going into a new organization, I always thought there were good things going on there and good people, but you've got to find them and then figure out that balance between sustainability and change. It can be much more effective if you've had the luxury of staying. Now, with mayoral control, if Menino had not gotten elected at some point along the way, and he went through three elections while I was superintendent, new superintendent, a new mayor came in and said, Boston Public School's been there, done that. I want to focus on uh, economic development. Not that economic development isn't important, but it, it is a huge factor, and I think you can see it in the Broad Prize districts. Most of the superintendents in the Broad Prize districts have had more than just two or three years in the position. I believe we have a question online. Yes, another question online. We, this is from uh, Carolyn Brown with Horton's Kids. Dr. Pazan, are there specific issues on which you'd like to see business leaders collaborate more closely with local school officials? Well, I think in, in any organization, in any relationship, there is, is room for improvement. And I'll give you an example of one that was very effective in Boston. Uh, when students first took the state assessment, which was required as a graduation requirement, the class of 2003 was the first one that had to pass the test in order to, gra to graduate from high school in Massachusetts. And they, 40% passed. We put together a package of things, and one of them was called Classroom in the Workplace. 
because urban kids in particular need to work in the summer and have summer jobs. And there was this tension between them needing a, a summer school program to help them ratchet up their math and literacy skills. And so the big employers came together. This was the mayor's idea, and it was brilliant. The first 90 minutes of every day in the summer, five days a week, Boston sent its teachers into the employers at their organization, and the kids had 90 minutes of instruction in literacy and or math. And then the other six and a half hours of the day, they were on their job. But the employers paid them for eight hours. That was a big win all the way around. And so there are interesting things that can be done that you might not have thought of that can bring business and school districts together for value added in a significant way. Fabulous. Any other questions? Yeah, I wondered um, in these tough budget times when you know budgets are being cut so badly and, and the schools are um, a big part of those budget cuts these days, do you see any opportunities to, to make change, something that we can, can make lemonade out of these lemons right now, um, despite the fact that resources are being cut so drastically? I think you have to, as a leader, look for opportunity in tough times. And the answer is yes, but it gets harder and harder when it's not just a year or two. A lot of people forget that in 2003, 2004, we had a small recession, and I had to cut 700 positions out of Boston Public Schools, and uh, 400 of them were teaching positions. And a lot of people forgot that, and now it was some recovery for two or three years, and then back into this, this whole piece. I think the problem is now you've got to identify where there are um, programs that have to be cut which will result in people being cut so that you don't lose the focus on the most critical areas in the work and it gets harder and harder to do. And the place you have to start is at the central office because the last thing you want to do is touch the classroom teacher if you can possibly avoid that. But what I'm seeing now in the coaching I'm doing with first-time urban superintendents is that, that they're down to bare bones now. And the next thing after what I've just said is raising class size. So that reduces position, but then that works against another valuable indicator in terms of what will happen, although um, a good teacher with more students will do better than a poor teacher with less. So, but that debate is going on right now in a lot of places. So I don't have a good answer for your, for your question. Um, and people are running out of good ideas about how to do this. But where there are opportunities to make a change, that's good. The other issue that comes in is there are a lot of union contracts that have last in, first out language. And Boston, Boston's a tough union town. Uh, 32 bargaining units in the city. I had 13 of them in the school department. And just as an aside, my whole career, my first superintendency was a f in, in Pennsylvania. Collective bargaining was brand new. Each of my five superintendencies were in collective bargaining districts. If I had 5% of the time back I spent on collective bargaining over the years, I've probably done a lot better job as a superintendent. But that's an aside. So it, it's, it's a, a, a real issue, and, and partially getting some, some trade-offs in your union contract, uh, not just freezing salaries, but if you've got a last in, first out, trying to go to the table and get some flexibility so you can keep your best people and not send them off and have the others just stay, which reduces the opportunity to make change and improvement in those tough times. Thank you. I think this, is, uh, this uh, draws us to a conclusion. I, I want to thank everyone for coming here to the Press Club, as well as the folks who have been watching us 
online. Uh, stay in touch with CED, and we'll be in touch shortly. Thank you so much.